I love Jesus how he heals in the scriptures. It's all different. There's no formula, you know. He just this time like <clears throat> just throw, throws it on the dude's eyes, man. It's crazy. Verse seven. And he said to him, "Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent." And he went and washed. I love that he gave him some directive too to kind of see where his faith was. He stepped into it, right? He went and washed. He didn't say, "Well, you know, I don't know about this guy." He walked into it, went and washed, and he came back seeing, right? Watch verse 8. Therefore, therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. He said, I am he. Now pause right there real quick. And just, just hang with me on this. This dude is blind, suffering for 20 years. Everybody around him knows him and where his, what his situation is. Then they see this dude healed. I want to I ask you a question. How many of those people you think believed in Jesus after they saw that? I'm going to conservatively say, let's say 20 people. I'm just going to throw it out there. Let's say 20 people's eternal destination changed as a result of seeing this man healed after 20 years of suffering. You're God. Is that worth it? I'm God. I want, I got 20 people for all eternity that I can spend eternity with. I don't know about you, but me, I have a heart for God. Like, like Paul said, Paul said, man, I, I'd go to the hell if all my Jewish folks would finally understand it and be able to go to heaven. 20 years of suffering, 20 eternal souls. God is more concerned with eternal souls than our temporal comfort and happiness. That's a hard pill to swallow. And that's not easy. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, He's not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. That's his heart. Number four. So we have Christians are a bunch of dorks. I like my sin too much. I had a tragedy happen. I'm mad at God. Number four, and I've heard this a lot lately. I had a bad experience at church growing up, and I'm never going to church ever again. You ever heard that one? Maybe that's you, and, and you somehow came and showed up today. And you swore, I'll never go back to church. They're a bunch of idiots, and they're pointing their finger at me, and they're hypocrites, and I got treated bad. I'm never coming back. Number one, can I apologize? Please hear my heart. May I apologize on the behalf of Jesus Christ and us misrepresenting who he is. I pray you'll receive that. Number one. But, number two, we need to be balanced. Jesus said, follow me. In fact, he said, deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow me. If I, if, here's what, here's, and this is really convicting me. If I hear, well, they didn't notice me. They did this to me. This is what happened to me. What is that? Me, 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 me. But Jesus said, if you want to deny yourself. That's selfish, man. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever misrepresented someone? You ever hurt anyone? How do you want them to react to you? I'm never dealing with you again. You had a bad hair day, and this is what you did. I'm never talking to you again. Listen, the church will have bad hair days. Maybe not me, but some of us will. Listen, I will let you down. I am a man. I am a flawed human being who desires not to. I will let you down. Jesus said, follow him. Now, on the other side of it, the church does need to represent Jesus Christ properly. And we pray that. We pray the Holy Spirit does that. And let me add this to this at this section of the, of, the, of the talk here. If ever we as a team misrepresent God and, and hurt you, please do me a favor and come to me and share your honest heart with me. Please do that. Don't go tell Aunt Sally and Cousin Rich and you know your neighbor, come to me. The Bible says in Matthew 18, if someone sins against you, come to that person and talk to them. And we will talk about it and we will deal with that. 
That's, that's, what, that's what believers are called to do. Because you know what? A lot of times I find it's just, it's just miscommunication. And people hightail from the church because of miscommunication. I want to be able to clear that up, come to an understanding in grace. Amen? I will, it's funny because we, my mom and I were doing a book fair and we stopped and we actually had a, uh, uh, a broccoli cheddar omelet. Like, where was that? I forget that, mom, where that was at. But, um, and do the cook, like burn up the bake or the, the broccoli, you know, and, and, um, and I'm like, well, that's all good, you know, I'll just kind of cut it off, you know, and I'll hammer it down, I was hungry, you know, and, and my mom's like, dude, tough on this, and, we, and then we were talking about that, man, we're so spoiled, we're complaining about burnt broccoli and stuff, you know, and, but as we, as we were leaving, kind of the manager of the store was kind of like, yo, how was, every, you know, how was everything, and, and my mom's such a nice person, you know, and, oh, everything was great, and, you know, and inside she's like, dude, the broccoli was burnt, you know, I saw that illustration, like, it would have been a tactful way for me to come up, you know, and say, hey, we, we appreciated the service. Service was great. We, we loved it. Great environment. But just maybe to help you, uh, you might want to share the, with the cook. Maybe steam the broccoli next time. You know, don't burn it. Or this might help your business and serve your customers properly. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Hey, come. I had a woman the other day write me a very tactful email saying, you know, I think you might have um, got the, the feast, the Jewish feast wrong and and you know what? I think I did misspeak from my notes. Again, I'm a caveman, so I'm going to misspeak. I love that. It was tactful. It was encouraging. It wasn't... <laughs> Pastor Todd, I need to teach about the Feast of the Tabernacles. You know what? It wasn't none of that. It was tactful and loving. And... I don't know why I just told you all that, but I did. I think that's healthy. <laughs> Listen, don't let that excuse be there anymore. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Allow God to minister to you. Forgive and move forward. Number five, on the belief barrier, family feud, top six here. Next on the survey, uh, pr pride. Can you write down pride? And here's what pride says. I got this whole thing figured out. I don't need God as a crutch. You got you Christians and everything. I, I got it figured out. I'll do it my way. How about that? That pains my heart. In fact, I say, really? I mean, tell me how that's working out for you. What's happening in your life right now? You've, you've got, I've got it my way. I'm doing it my way. I see 40, 50 year old men on the couch of a, of a one bedroom apartment because they're so prideful, they'll say, I'll do it my way. And their family's back, and their second family's in the house, and there's destruction because of pride of man. And they shoot themselves in the foot and bleed out in life. And God's saying, I got so much more for you if you'll just believe. Pride. Finally, number six, and this is kind of where we'll really study the scripture in today. And it has to do with uh, intellectualism, which isn't a problem I have because I'm not the brightest guy around. But some of you guys in here have been gifted with great minds. And your intellect is a barrier getting, keeping you away from full engaging in Christ. Full belief. Full surrender. You're a skeptic. Now, I think there's two forms of skepticism. There's one form that's honest, desiring to know the truth. I want to know the evidence. I don't want to just go in blind. I want to know the evidence. But once they find out the evidence and they are completely on the same page, they'll dive in. That's the good skeptic. Then there's another skeptic, though, that, in my opinion, it's a front to hide behind the guise of this intellectualism. And they, you know what? They generally don't even, they're, they're, masked, they're hiding behind that. A lot of the Bible has all these contradictions and is that right? You studied the Bible then. Okay? You've gone from Genesis to Revelation. You've, you've had an honest heart to see exactly what the deal is. No, in fact, I haven't heard it. I've never read it one time. But I know they're in there. There's a man named Lee Strobel, who some of you are familiar with, who was an atheist and set out to disprove Christianity.